Welcome to this lecture about the unpaired t-test. A t-test is a statistical test where the test statistic follows a t-distribution. The most common types of t-test are the one-sample t-test, as we discussed in the previous video, the unpaired t-test that we will discuss in this video, and the paired t-test that we will have a look at in the next video. An unpaired t-test also called independent two-sample t-test, is a statistical test to compare the means of two populations. Since we usually cannot measure the whole population, we take a sample and use a t-test to predict if the population means are different or not. Note, if you happen to know the value of the population variance, the corresponding z-test is preferred over the t-test. We can for example use an unpaired t-test to compare two different diets where five individuals try diet A and another five individuals try diet B. Note that the individuals in the two different groups should be independent. For example, if five people first try diet A and then diet B, the two groups are no longer independent because the same person tries both diets. In such a case, we should use a paired t-test which we'll discuss in the next lecture. Another example of the use of an unpaired t-test could be to test if there is a difference in heights between plants in field A versus field B. Note that the plants in field A should grow independently from the plants in field B. We'll now see how an unpaired t-test works by using the following example where one wants to test if the systolic blood pressure, the upper blood pressure, is different between people in the age 20 to 35 compared to people in the age 36 to 55. To test this, one has collected four random individuals from the relevant population where people are at age between 20 to 35 and four individuals from the population where people are in age between 36 to 55. Note, if we do this study in the real world, we should collect many more participants for our study. The reason why I only have four individuals in each group is that it will simplify our calculations in this lecture. Based on our observed measurements of the systolic blood pressure, we can make the following plot. This point represents the systolic blood pressure of the first person in the age group 20 to 35, whereas this point represents the second person in the same group. This point represents the systolic blood pressure of the first person in the age group 36 to 55, and so forth. We will here use an unpaired t-test to test if there is a difference in the systolic blood pressure between people in the two age groups. The null hypothesis in this case states that the two population means are equal. In other words, the null hypothesis tells us that the mean systolic blood pressure is the same in the two age groups. In contrast, the alternative hypothesis states that the mean systolic blood pressure is different between the two age groups. The t-test will help us to decide which of these hypotheses that we should believe in. In this example, we use a significance level of 0.05. Let's first calculate the mean systolic blood pressure for the two age groups. The mean systolic blood pressure of the four individuals in the younger group is 124 and 129 of the four individuals in the older group. Based on the two samples, we see that the mean systolic blood pressure is higher for the older individuals compared to the younger individuals. However, this difference could be due to chance we might have randomly selected four individuals from the age group 36 to 55, which happen to have a relatively high blood pressure compared to other people in that age group. Or we might have happened to collect four young individuals with relatively low blood pressure. By using a t-test, it will help us to determine if this absurd difference in the sample means is due to chance, or if it actually reflects that there is a true difference in the mean systolic blood pressure between the age groups. The equation for computing a t-statistic for an unpaired t-test looks like this when the two groups have an equal sample size. Since we have four observations from each group, our two groups have the same sample size. Note that one can reformulate this equation to other forms. If you read about an unpaired t-test in other places, they may use different formulas. 
X bar 1 denotes the sample mean of group 1, whereas X bar 2 denotes the sample mean of group 2. The numerator therefore represents the difference between the two sample means. This represents the sample variance of group 1, and this is the sample variance of group 2. Remember that the sample variance is calculated at the sum of the square differences between the observations and the mean, divided by n-1. For example, to calculate the variance of group 2, we subtract the mean value from each observed value. Then we square those differences, and then sum those square differences and divide by the sample size minus 1. The variance of group 2 is about 6.67. In this example, the variance of group 1 happened to have the same variance as group 2. N1 and N2 denote the sample size of group 1 and 2. Recall that the square root of the variance divided by the sample size is the standard error of the mean. The denominator therefore represents the standard error of the difference between the two sample means, which tells us the uncertainty of the difference we have observed. Note that this equation is only valid if the two groups have the same sample size. If the sample sizes of the two groups are not equal, the equation becomes a bit more complicated. This is because we put more weight on the variance of the group with the largest sample size. For example, if the sample size of group 1 is bigger than the sample size of group 2, we would put more weight on the variance from the first group when we pool the two variances. However, since our two groups had the same sample size, we can use the simpler formula. We now plug in our numbers for the means, the variances, and the sample sizes. We see that the difference between the two means is negative 5, and that the standard error of this difference is about 1.83. The ratio of the difference between the means and the corresponding standard error is negative 2.74, which represents our t-statistic. This number can be interpreted as the younger individuals have systolic blood pressure that is, on average, 2.74 standard errors lower than the older individuals. We then use a t-distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the total sample size minus 2. The reason why you subtract by 2 is because we estimate two means in the unpaired t-test. Our degrees of freedom is therefore 4 plus 4 minus 2, which is 6. We then use the statistical software to calculate the area to the left hand side of negative 2.74 and to the right hand side of positive 2.74, since we use a two sided test. The corresponding p value is therefore the sum of the area of these two tails, which is about 0.034. This value represents our p-value. If the null hypothesis is true, which states that the two means are equal, the probability of observing a t-statistic or more extreme in our example is about 3.4%. It is therefore quite unlikely that the difference we have observed in our sample is due to chance. Since the p-value in this example is less than our significance level 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. And since the estimated mean blood pressure is greater for the ones in the older age group compared to the younger age group, we can draw the conclusion that people in the age 36 to 55 have, on average, a significantly higher systolic blood pressure compared to the people in the age 20 to 35. The results from a t-test are usually reported together with 95% confidence interval. This equation can be used to calculate the confidence interval for the difference between the means. Just as the unpaired t-test, the corresponding confidence interval is also based on the difference between the means and the standard error of that difference, which is computed in the denominator in the formula for the t-statistic. Note. 
If the sample sizes of the two groups are different, the standard error of the confidence interval will be based on the expression in the denominator of the more complicated formula for the t-test. From our previous calculations of the t-test, we know that the standard error of the difference within the means is 1.83 and that the difference within means is negative 5. We can now plug in the values for the difference between the means and the standard error by using a software or a t-table based on 6 degrees of freedom and an alpha value of 0 0.05, we can extract the t-score 2.45 from a t-distribution. 2.45 times 1.83 is about 4.5. We can now create our 95% confidence interval. We see that we are 95% certain that the two difference within the population means lies somewhere between negative 9.5 and negative 0.5. Note that this interval does not include the value 0, because 0 is greater than the upper limit of the confidence interval, which is negative 0 0.5. Remember that the null hypothesis states that the two population means should be equal. If we move mu2 to the left hand side, the null hypothesis now states that the difference between the two population means should be equal to 0. Since zero is outside this interval, we can therefore reject the null hypothesis also by using our 95% confidence interval. We'll come to the same conclusion as if we would use the p-value from a two-sided unpaired t-test. The unpaired t-test, as well as the confidence interval, rely on two major assumptions, normal distribution and equal variance. If the spread of our data appears to be approximately normally distributed for both groups like this, we can assume that we do not violate the assumption of normality. However, we should be a bit worried if our data is spread like this, which is highly skewed. If you remember the video about the central limit theorem, we can assume that the sample means are normally distributed if our sample size is large. Therefore, if the sample size of the two groups is greater than about 30, the t-test should still be valid. However, in this case, where we have about 15 data points in each group, we should consider a non-parametric test if our data is highly skewed, or try to, for example, transform the data and run the t-test based on the transformed data. To analyze if our data is normally distributed, we can study the distribution of our data or use a statistical test such as the shapir wilk test. Analyzing normality is covered in another video. If you have only a few data points, like in this example, it is impossible to know the online distribution of the variable. However, we could then rely on previous studies showing that the variable is normally distributed. For example, if we know that systolic blood pressure in the population is normally distributed, we could use that information to assume that we fulfill the assumption of normality. The second assumption for an unpaired t-test is that the two populations should have equal variance. However, since we have just taken a sample, we will never know if the two populations have equal variance. We should therefore analyze the variance of our sample. In this example, the variance of group 1 is 25 and the variance of group 2 is 19. Due to chance, it is normal to see a small difference in the variances between the two groups. Levine's test is commonly used to test the assumption of equal variance. Note that the null hypothesis of the Levine's test states that the two populations have equal variance. Thus, if our p-value from Levine's test is greater than our significance level, which is usually set to 0 0.05. It is likely that the observed difference in the variances we see is just due to chance. We can therefore assume that the two groups have equal variance. In contrast, if the p-value of the beans test is less than the significance level 0 0.05, we'll reject the null hypothesis of equal variance. If we violate the assumption of equal variance, we may then instead use the so-called Welch's t-test.
which can handle an unequal variance of the two groups. Welch's t-test uses the same simple formula as we have seen previously, even if the two groups have an unequal sample size. The difference is that the Welch's t-test uses a t-distribution with degrees of freedom calculated by the following formula. This formula is based on the variances of the two groups and the sample sizes. For example, if we would plug in the variances and the sample sizes of the two groups of the following data, we see that the degrees of freedom is equal to about 5.89. We would then use the t-distribution with 5.89 degrees of freedom. The p-value is then calculated as we've seen previously, which is the area in the two tails defined by the t-statistic. For the corresponding confidence interval, we use the same calculations as we have seen previously, but where we extract the critical value from the t-distribution with the given degrees of freedom according to the formula. This was the end of this lecture about the unpaired t-test. Thanks for watching.